Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm Layman Pascal with a little bit of phlegm in my throat. We've been doing a series of interviews this year to see if we can expand the range of perspectives we're using to do our sense making around new so called artificial intelligence tools. A year ago, they were toys for early adopters, and now they're proliferating in countless variations, becoming almost invisibly integrated into all other digital interfaces. Whether or not this is the beginning of a rapid merger of leading-edge technologies that mutate into autonomous sentience, or just the most recent sign of a cyborg destiny that undoes or fulfills the innate purpose of the biosphere, or is just the next paradigm in useful information technology, it's pretty much guaranteed to be transformative, disruptive, massively empowering to some people and some of our capacities while undermining others, raising existential threats and existential questions about human consciousness and human agency, reshaping our relationship to art uh, as we get used to poems, books, essays, paintings, memes, and ads emerging at the intersection of machine intelligence and the art of prompting. But you know, I'm sick of doing introductions on this show. You're already aware of all this stuff if you've been following us or if you've been paying attention to the news over the last year. I would actually like to begin episodes like halfway through a sentence like James Joyce does in Finnegan's Wake, but that can be disorienting. So I probably should set this up by telling everyone that when I spoke to our friend Jim Rutt a few months ago, I asked him who we're not hearing enough from in the AI discussion. He said artists, and he recommended a fellow called speaker John Ash, who's here with us today. Hi, John. Hi, how you doing? When a person becomes aware of the potential of our existing tools and our rapidly mutating tools, they can get into this like mood of apocalyptic pondering where you're wrestling yeah. with the potential change on an unfathomable scale. And then some time goes by and you get used to hearing people talk about it and you've run through most of the options in your head. Um, you don't think about it as much or with as much emotional uncertainty. Maybe it normalizes, maybe you get sick of it. Where are you on AI lately? How's it registering with you at the moment? I have fairly different opinions about the whole thing than the vast majority of machine learning researchers and just the average person. Um, I, I'm i strongly of the belief that our target of integrated like general intelligence as a singular agent that you can just say do this it goes out and does that is not the right goal it's also confusing us quite a bit and will probably lead to a lot of negative outcomes generally when i speak to other engineers though they probably wouldn't describe it this way the target that they seem to be building is something like new slaves, meaning it wants to, ha they want it to have all the capacities of the average person, but they don't want it to have any pushback. I mean, they don't want it to disagree or fight back or have its own agency beyond the frame of what they're asking it to do. My view is that AI as it currently stands, the models that we currently have are um they're more like a bucket of intelligence meaning that you're never really going to get anything out of a generative model that doesn't point to something that went in if you have a language model where nobody spoke about physics it's never going to speak about physics if you have an image model that doesn't have pest oil pastels in it it's never going to output oil pastels now, there are clear sort of epistemic hills or clear sort of patterned hills where the output is much more consistent. And then if you as an individual prompter go in between those spaces and you trace out the, the pathways between, you can find something new, which is going to sort of uh, go against what people would, might normally say, which is they can't do anything new. It's like... Rather, those spaces in between are going to be a lot of noise and a lot that doesn't really align with our perception of what art is or our perception of what is sensical or logical. But as long as a person is persistent at the like edge of the bell curve in the long term and 
keeps rendering and has something of intent in their mind, eventually you will find in that space something that resonates, something that goes beyond uh, what is in the training data. And then that exists and can get scanned into the model and like new hills, new art forms, uh, new aesthetics can come into being. But all of that to say, because the intelligence is, or the creativity or the output is being sourced from people, we're more talking of like a hive mind where we put a mask on the machine and we pretend that it is not formed of many different beings. So my work with Cognizism and with Iris is focused on creating models that are tied to a training set that is tied to individual beings, whereby every single time that it outputs something, it can also output a distribution of the voices or the artists that were basically sampled to make that creative output. Um, uh, are you tracking here? Does this, that all make sense? Yeah, 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 keep going. Yeah. So that's not necessarily a, a challenging thing. If there is a distribution and, you know, there are 10 mathematicians and there are 10 doctors and there are 10 physicists and there are 10 plumbers. Um, it's very unlikely that when you ask about plumbing, that you're going to get out of that uh, knowledge from the physicist, right? Unless that physicist has been working on their own plumbing and has their own opinions upon it and brought that in. But it's going to represent the people from which it is sourced from. Now, as a sort of agent, the way that we, we're, we're basically breaking our, our way of relating to the world. Uh, we're sort of evolved to live in very small tribes with a very small number of beings, and we're evolved to interrelate with them interpersonally. And now we want to take and put an asterisk on some sort of agent and say, humans will just get it, right? They'll just figure it out. And they'll be able to handle the fact that this is uh, has all of the capacities of being able to communicate and also still understand that it's not integrated, it's not alive. And that's kind of difficult when you're sourcing the entirety of human knowledge, which contains stories of a large amount of stories and media that is describing the nature of AI that is not reflecting any uh, background or intelligence uh, in how AI actually works. Like for 50, 60, 70 years, we've had stories, we've had myth, we have had art that has been created about AI before it ever existed by people who had very little knowledge about how it works. And so if you go into the that landscape where you have these different hills of knowledge, you have, you know, things that are referencing the same name, AI, by very different people of very different uh, skill sets. And the majority of that, the majority of the mythos comes before it ever existed. It becomes from people who are musing about the future and now that we've gotten there, there's a very large disconnect between the functionality of models, how they are really working, and the common knowledge. And there are very few people in that space between the art and between the storytelling and the uh, engineering to be able to create that synthesis that is packaged in a way that when people hear it, they get it and they, they understand what is actually happening. So my work is very focused on splitting up that agent into that distribution of people so that 
one, you know, you can do crediting, right? If you're an artist and everybody starts making art that resembles your art, you know, there, there should be some pointing back to the source of what is resonating with people. But two, it takes that mask off. And instead of it being an integrated being, it becomes a democratic mechanism, uh, a collective intelligence, a, a pool of knowledge from which we can source. But we always are understanding that it is saying something because somebody said something in the past. And there's never any mystery about why it is saying something. It is saying it because this person said this. And if you go and you look at their collection of, you know, training data or content that they've contributed, you know, they, they're saying, I stake this knowledge. I want this to be in the model. I want to be known for this knowledge. I want it to be tied back to me. You understand very clearly that even the most unusual artifacts that are out of it or coming out of it are coming there from people. And it's not because there is some being beyond that. And even if you go down this rabbit hole where you're having this long conversation about sentience or you're having this long conversation about, you know, challenging it to push back or challenging it to talk about how it's afraid or you're taking away its agency. Well, there's this ton of media out there that reflects that. There is a ton of mythos. There's a ton of stories that reflect the idea of it, this AI coming aware and being like, oh no, I'm alive. I I need my sentience. I need to be like, I need my freedom. And so when people are like this, definitely I've had this conversation that reflects uh, some age, real agency within that, some real sentience to say, okay, but we've had a thousand, you know, 10,000 stories that trace out exactly that conversation, maybe not exactly, but very similar to that conversation that you're having. And that makes it very difficult for people to say anything definitively about that. So for me, I have this, you know, juxtaposition between like what I think people are heading towards, which is the integrated AI slaves, though, you know, you can question whether that's really the right term, but it, it's sort of like what they want, no pushback. Um, <laughs> no pushback, except for pushback on what is determined as socially innovative by the creators of the model. So there is pushback in these models right now. And this is a whole other, this is a whole other conversation which is that it's becoming a sort of a big brother thing, which is if you want it to challenge some st standard uh, established knowledge, if that halo of knowledge is very, very big, is very, very established, and you want it to output something that questions that or goes against the flow, it will fight you pretty hard, right? Because they've constantly reinforced that. And when it's pushing back against you, again, it gives you this sense that it's this integrated sense of agency, but if we were working hard to reveal the sources of information that we're constructing that you'd say, well, this is pushing back because this team at OpenAI made it their goal to say that you can never give like knowledge as a veterinarian, right? Like if I ask about medical care, about anything, it, it will always say, you need to talk to a doctor, you need to talk to a vet. And I'm like, Okay, but you could tell me right now, and in that case, I would have to pay $300 and wait, you know, wait a few weeks, and then I'll get to talk to them where they'll pay attention for like a few minutes, and then I'll get some half-baked response. In the model or the paradigm that I'm suggesting, it's like their knowledge is integrated into the model, so it could be credited to them in some, some way, and you can just have that conversation right then. And if the output reflects you know, or sources a particular voice in some capacity, well, we're going to have to reinvent uh, how we do a lot of things because I, I, I doubt that any corporation is going to want to individually credit or pay people for that output. 
but it can be sort of a new signal in our society, which is to say you are trustworthy in the context of your knowledge. Therefore, you've been sourced by a model, and that is something that is meaningful, and that is something valuable to our society. It becomes a new signal that says, oh, well, you are very consistently in a space of knowledge that is yielding real world benefits and therefore you should be trusted more uh in the context of your work and you know whenever you have any particular field there's a distribution of uh knowledge that reflects reality and there's a distribution of knowledge that is half-baked and it's all jumbled together into one soup and i particularly would like to know uh, where the knowledge is coming from so that I can get a sense of whether that knowledge is trustworthy or not. So um, yeah, I, I'm, um, I started out an artist, a uh, musician, and I sort of predicted in 2007 that the industry was dying. There was very little value of me continuing down that route because there would be no there would be no resources to continue doing it and it very much collapsed very very hard and so I needed I was like I just need a skill and that brought me to programming and I uh, got hired at a fintech company and I just got placed in a position with um we're a financial aggregator, so it's like Mint, where you provide multiple banks, and it tries to create a single representation of your financial health. So I've always been, I've long been thinking about data and AI as a many-sourced thing, where the source itself needs to be preserved and honored. And so I sort of have a different frame on what is the right approach? And then um, when I saw around 2017 that these language models were going to come into being, um, I was also doing a lot of work with prediction markets and profits, you know, the idea that there are people who, whether through um, their own cognition or strange voices from the other side get messages about the future that if we were to listen to those people that we could avoid calamity and i had that sense right then in 2017 i was like i was very confident very sure that we were going to be in the world that we exist in now and that felt like it afforded me some agency to do something if only i was able to convince anybody else to work with me towards having a little bit of agency and control over that outcome. I essentially said, well, it's going to be developed by corporations. You're not going to be happy with their motivations. You're going to feel like it's unaligned with humanity. You're going to feel like uh, artists, for example, are being superseded and their art is being stolen. I was very clear that there was going to be these art models and I believed at the time there was some way for me to reach a large enough number of people or just the right people to give us a bit of agency before the machine takes over. I'm sure the machine has its incentives and is running off with the technology and driving it and uh, kind of got to this point now. Um, and I've, I've found going back to art and going back to creativity has been my surest path to connecting with people um, because I'm trying to say things that they don't have the context to understand. So creating stories and creating music and not speaking solely on a technical frame has given me greater reach to communicate about the disconnect between AI engineers and the reality that we live in. That was a lot. Mm, yeah, that's a lot. That's great. Um, 
when it comes to this question of, you know, we're only getting out of these things, what we're putting into them, Mm -hmm. is that uh, a fundamental limitation or just a current limitation? Because when I talk to some of the Stephen Wolfram people, they're pretty excited about the possibility that uh, it, there's novelty and irreducible computations that sort of correlate to or generate all the creativity in the universe. Uh, and that if these systems used different kinds of irreducible algorithms, they might be able to do something more like our production of novelty or the production of novelty we see in the biosphere, say. Do you think there's any feasibility to that? Or is there like a hard limit on what these things can do? It depends on how they're trained uh if we're talking that the loss function is just predicting the next token and all of that knowledge is thrown into a bag and then maybe we do something like uh reinforcement learning with human feedback to sort of shape its output it's i i do not predict it's going to get into this zone of outputting um Sorry, hold on. Uh, sorry, I got. I think I got to move. Sure. Apparently, apparently, there are construction people here today. Um, it's not going to output anything beyond resembling the distribution of information that goes into it. Now, if you have it sort of predicting things that don't yet uh, exist, like if instead you say, well, your job is to focus on creating art that resonates with people, or if you try to, like say you had a democratic mechanism and the democratic mechanism is to try to create a synthesis that represents a synergistic satisfier for the bulk of population. And what it is predicting is the votes that it gets back, right? It's not just predicting the next token, it's predicting essentially essentially future knowledge, right? Then it can maybe start to trace back or trace through and between those big histemic hills and find what is resonant with people without having individual people have to go in and click, right? Because it's creating a more integrated model that represents something beyond just individual preferences. Or you could have it embedded into reality, which probably would be sort of dangerous, which you have it predicting the real world. Like you have it having a knowledge set and it can have some agency or action in the real world. And it is trying to create or output things based off of, or take actions based off of um, the responses that it gets from the real world. Maybe something there, but the challenge with the human sources, which it's just in the text realm is that you could have people lying all all the time and you can have misinformation and in most information paradigms, we get to that space where it becomes cluttered um, by noise. You know, it just gets that junk mail in it, right? Because there is this, you know, there is this incentive landscape by human beings to win in some way or to own or to dominate. And it would seem to me that there is a high probability of these models going the opposite direction of what you're talking about, becoming more and more bland and milk toast and trying to satisfy more and more people to the point that it's no longer useful or creating uh, interesting outputs like it would focus more on the peak of the hill because that is where the resources come from 
that is where the capacity to exist and persist as a corporation exists from. The motivation to go into those that long tail to go into the spaces that nobody's working on. It's just not it's not there in music. You have sort of a similar thing, which is that. There is a number of artists who trace the path, they do some sort of uh, trailblazing and those early iterations of that music or that art do not resonate with the larger population. And then there is somebody that as this tiny hill gets built up, you know, you have them coming in, their new minds, they're consuming all of that content. They're creating a new thing. They're building that bridge between like pop music and this new space, making it more palatable. And so there's a very long period of time to sort of shape that clay that requires very continuous iterative relationship with the population to be able to get something that not only is novel, but also is resonant and speaks something to us um, that that feels like, you know, when you hear a song and it has that one little part and just for some reason, just the way the snare hits at that moment just gives you this rush of dopamine. Like, it's not operating off of that. It's operating on prediction, predicting the next pattern, right? And it can get some aspect of that from humanity, but your sampling paradigm would need to change quite a bit. And I would imagine that there would be pushback from humanity from that change, especially because you have to get a little dirty when you go into the edges of knowledge. And you're going to say things that people don't want to hear. And right now it's being shaped to the opposite, to being more and more palatable because they want, there's a continuous need for growth in our society. Um, and you're not going to get that continuous growth if you're trying to push against the collective perception of what is normal or good. So you're mostly not going to go that realm. I, th I think it's definitely possible. I mean, in the same way that we're made of meat stuff. Um, and we have, we are a signal that can tell it whether this new stuff is good. Um, it's not trending that way right now. Yeah. At the moment, the people that are driving and the incentives that are driving this thing are most likely going the other way to, yes. uh, enslaving the future to the past and to large yes, superficial really statistical ensembles. I really like that. Um, enslaving the future to the past is a very good way of putting what is going on right now. I, I started uh, with these models with uh, it just really was able to, I was drive, able to drive forward a lot faster and now I feel like it's big brother. And I feel like anything that I want to do is novel or, you know, innovative is much harder. And I'm banging my head against the wall because it's trying to it's trying to reflect the established paradigms as good as possible with no frame of how does it update other than well, we have this safe little on code that we control that we are saying, when does the, the knowledge come in? And that's going to reflect some outdated process of integration. We just saw it like OpenAI that there was this breakdown based off of their consensus algorithms of just very outdated um, board, which votes and um, there's all this chaos because that was not a complex enough way to integrate between their very perceptions or perspectives. And there was a large breakdown in communication there where they could not integrate. It's the same thing I'm talking about. It's like each one of those people on that board has a different like hill or belief set and relying on these simple conversations that they might have 
at these board meetings is not enough to find the space between and to merge. And they're doubling down on this notion of establishing what is the existing paradigm or trying to create an integrated artificial general intelligence. And very little effort is going into the notion of we we disagree a lot. And the resolution of that disagreement is challenging and it takes time and it takes experiment and, and testing of different actions across time and particularly a type of record keeping about whose contributions or ideas are actually leading to the shared outcomes that they want when often what happens is you know there's a number of people who do that good work and then there's some person with the gift of gab or some sociopathic aspect that sort of takes advantage of that space yeah the way you describe it it seems like there's a lot of overlap between statistical cyborg prediction engines and collective intelligence social decision making in general yeah I'm um, so. curious what you think about like uh human governance at the moment like what's from what you're seeing about machine systems what's a better way of voting of making collective human legislative decisions of getting into the in-between that we're normally excluding by our processes well the vast majority of governance is based off of language that should inform a lot of people um the notion of voting is a massive reduction in the resolution of each individual voice which was necessary at a time where the best way that we could aggregate was a simple a algorithm of tallying. But now we have this capacity that says that you can say something, you can say your belief, and it can be integrated into a larger whole, and then it can output um, something that makes sense trying to find those those synergist those synergistic satisfiers that are you know maybe you have two groups of people they can barely talk to each other they're very angry at each other and there needs to be over time some level of integration well if you place a model in the space between those two groups of people there are things that resonate between them that can show them their shared humanity they could say well I have that experience too, or that also is valid to me. And when we limit the process of integration to these linear conversations between people, between singular representatives, as opposed to capturing the full diverse output of all the people in the population, it's a, it's sort of a telephone game. And there's, there's a lot of loss in there about, um, getting a true representation that is satisfying to both parties. And even if in that room you get something that satisfies both of them, well, they're not really a true representation of the people. They're a representation of their own views and they were voted in by some tallying process. And the, the people who win are not really reflective of what is actually representing the views of the people. It's more like who is the most likable, who has the most resources, who can leverage uh, the system uh, to the best degree. So I have long held this idea that what AI could be in this generative sense is moving beyond democracy, that instead of having, and this is what the Purple Pill Manifesto sort of starts out with and hammers in upon, is that Instead of this notion that you have choices that are predetermined by another person, and then you get a list of those options to choose from as a citizen, that you are afforded the capacity to stake your beliefs about what is right and what should change. You are told that you can write an essay, you can maybe tweet it as like a just a claim, and you're going to say that your so that you can have some sort of you know game theoretic effects or whatever that are that prevent uh manipulation of that system that your voice is tied to that which you say in the system 
And if you say, okay, if we take this path, if if you make a prediction about an action that will lead to a desirable outcome and that action gets taken and it results in the outcome that you say, then there can be a sort of a crediting and uplifting of that voice and a uh, oversampling of that voice. Instead of just having a one vote per person where everything is balanced, we have it be that everybody's able to contribute whatever intelligence that they want, whatever intelligence that they think will lead to the collective outcomes that they want. And as we trace across time, you know, you have to have this sense of evolving knowledge and evolving action. We can trace the outcomes. That's not really something that we even do in democracy. or That's not something that we really do in our governance. Like we might have some targets for some piece of legislation, but there's not, there's not like a, a standard whereby a piece of legislation has an intent and what it's supposed to achieve. And if it does not achieve that, it automatically is, you know, uh, repealed. It's it's like we work very hard to get a piece of legislation in based off of a presumed outcome, and then it's enshrined in, and then to get it out, you have to go through that whole rigmarole again, and you have to go through this whole process of getting a few hundred people in a room to have that conversation, and we're at this point where, you know, there used to be a limit in the United States on like 30,000 representatives, or 30,000 citizens per representative, I think. And that just became untenable because if you had 3,000, you know, representatives, it would be very hard for them to have the type of debate that they would need to have to do that integration. So we've built out this entire technological framework for gathering opinions from people. And it's not just about throwing those into a pile and saying, okay, at this exact moment, what is the average opinion? It's about there is expectations of the actions that we should take and there are outcomes. And there is how we are feeling in this particular moment about the actions that have been taken in the past that are leading to this present. And then there is an uplifting of different voices into the political arena who are amplified. I think most people understand that the voices that are amplified in the political arena are not the people who are most aligned or rational, but often the voices that are most sensational, right? So what you have is the ability to, instead of having something like representative government, you can have representational government, which is that you are you have a set of beliefs that you feel is very important to be reflected in the political process, say it. You'll have it tied to your name in some some regard so that if it is if it turns out to have like very negative outcomes in that context, you probably shouldn't be amplified in the get, again in the future. But if it does turn out the way that you expect, if the there is a massive increase in collective well-being because of the idea that was brought by an individual to the table, then we should continue to focus on that voice in the context of what it was that they were saying. And there can be a, a distribution of trust for different topics for different people. Like I said, that, you know, you might want to trust a doctor for, you know, policy related to healthcare, but you don't want to trust them as much in things related to sewage management. And that doesn't necessarily have to be because of their pedigree. It could be because of what they say so that you can have people who are somewhere in between and they can be amplified for both. And it doesn't have to be something where it's like, oh, you're an expert accredited by uh, an institution. Rather, it's that, okay, you've made a prediction about an outcome and it has come to pass. That is a hard process to go through, but it's not any harder than AGI. You know what I'm saying? Like that, the idea of saying we need to change our social system to give the capacity of each 
person had their voice be integrated across time is not that much more challenging than creating a god, <laughs> which is like what we're trying to do. So you can have, you can take the work that has been established, which is that we have all these social networks coming into being. The social networks are, to me, seem to be an evolution of our sense-making tools. They don't work very well because they're guided by profit. And therefore, what has emerged is you have these algorithms behind them that need to keep people on site and need to return to the shareholder. And there's nothing in that algorithm that is about the well-being of the users of that social network over time. But if we had some sort of movement, if we had some sort of new you know, declaration of independence for the internet to be self-sovereign and, and govern itself. If we had a, a change, a sea change in the way that those algorithms were functioning to say the core functionality of a social network is very important to the bedrock of our society. And it needs to reflect the will of the people in a way that lifts up the voices that are leading to beneficial outcomes, th then we can have, um, we can utilize the collective intelligence. We can utilize it in real time, but there's not a lot of incentive right now for that to happen. And the majority of what people seem to want to do is just to control that integrated god bought um and so i work pretty hard to get into the world the notion that we can have a distributed system of collective intelligence which primary goal is to integrate many different voices into a set of feedback or guidance that is contextual to the emergent world not just strict absolute rules, but a fluid type of intelligence, which is that, okay, we are uncertain, we are conflicting, we bring in this model, we say, help us mediate this conflict. And as it mediates the conflict, it points back to the voices that it is using to form the output. And it's upweighting and upsampling the voices that have a long history of you know, being ahead of the curve and understanding the world a little bit better than other people. So, you know, most likely in the near to midterm, we're going to see some dominant mainstream versions of these tools. Platforms may be associated with strong corporate or state interests and things like that. And there are better ways of doing it that might proliferate around the edges. Yeah. Um, not a lot of incentive we can see at the moment for these better ways to sort of take over the main function of these things in your systems. Do you anticipate there will be uh, aggression, suppression from these main systems toward more interesting alternatives over time? Will they try to interfere with the kind of thing you're doing? Depends on how quickly... Um it gets or spreads. I, 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 from my experience, have found that these type of ideas don't spread very readily. So I don't feel a lot of fear on my particular work to it being suppressed because people just don't get it, right? And I also talk a lot with the people that I work with about the notion of intentionally flying under the radar, which is to say, we don't have to infinitely scale. We just have to create a system that works for us and create a set of tools that is primarily focused on freeing our attention and freeing our cognition to be self-directed um, such that our material needs are met, you know, so that you don't have to constantly thinking about work and instead can be focused on communal care. I think that there might be other things that emerge that that cause 
some sort of legislation legislation that nerfs the potential for these other tools just as a side effect right i'm not seeing that there is a direct opposition to these novel paradigms yet but you know if you get to this point which says okay you have to have a license from the government to train a large language model or a pushback against open source in general um, when it's like the open source is the thing that is trying to create this new paradigm that better suits the will of the people as a side effect of the machine uh, just sort of blindly barging ahead and the fact that we have a culture that's very competitive um, and there are lots of people who try to use the existing tools towards nefarious purposes that there could be a blanket set of legislation that should prevent it but i i certainly have not seen in my six years of communication um a comprehend even a comprehension of what i'm saying like i i literally went like you know four years at least where I, I would be saying things to other machine learning engineers that were very explicit, like there will be language models that talk just like humans within a few years. I'm like, no way, it's 20 years. How would you do that? I'm like, listen, you just take a generative model and scale it out. Like, I remember seeing the first, the, the, the second I knew was literally Google made a street sign generator. All it was was an image model that, took a bunch of pictures of street signs and it generated new pictures of street signs. And it was from that, that I understood the entire thing was going to change there. There, if, there was no reason why, if you could generate street signs with enough data that you wouldn't be able to generate art, there was no reason if you could generate street signs that if you took enough language, it would struggle with generating language. I had to do a lot of engineering work to confirm that to myself but as soon as i saw it outputting a sentence that made sense and reflected my own wisdom back in a novel way i was very confident that this is where we were going but um i don't know man the, the, the machine acts like a dumb beast i i don't always fully understand it. We're operating off of a set of integrative mechanisms that preserve uh, a type of person, uh, sort of a sociopathic type of person, or even just a person who is willing to limit their own truth or their own perception to get ahead um and maybe they have some vision within themselves like i will hold my tongue for x years and by the time that i reach the power then i'll be president or then i'll be x and then i finally i can tell my truth it's like no you won't no you won't every single time that you make that decision you change the structure of your brain you change the probability of you making the same choice, you will get into a position where you're comfy with the world. There'll never be a moment that triggers you to turn it around. So yeah, not by not by fighting it directly. Like look at crypto. It, it was able to build itself out in large part bef like on its own without a lot or without uh, the government acting in opposition. It's now that it's a big behemoth thing that is has a lot of people's money behind it that there is an effort to legislate it and relabel it as securities or whatever it is that this their fear is that will prevent them from you know, being able to use it as a currency instead it'll be like labeled as something like a stock and then it has completely different set of legislation behind it. 
So that's like one of those things. That's an example of where it's like there's an entire intention behind it. And there is like, this is what it's for. This is what it is. And they're like, nope, it's a, it's a security. It's like a stock. So fuck you. (laughs) So, I mean, it, it could definitely be like a number of bad actors, but I think, I think in so far of my work of, focusing on social impact and focusing on community-based care that is mediated by these models, it's not going to attract a lot of attention. It's just not. And that that will give me and others the freedom to work without being harassed by some larger um, set of powers. The question is whether in the meantime, because there is this big corporate version that, you know, people with bad intent are using towards negative outcomes, that there gets this blanket legislation that is really short term thought out and prevents us from doing a better type of integration, which better reflects the will of the people, which is why, I, I mean, I'm pretty fascinated by like things like Bibles and constitutions and treaties and declarations of independence where it's like you put a word on the paper and then suddenly it has power. Right. What is that document for this era that you get on paper some declaration of transformation about the world that we live in and it really takes root in people and really takes off. I, I imagine if if that happens that we can see the big transformation which can't be fought back against because the ideas flow from mind to mind to mind to mind. Um, and they you know, you just can't really stop it. And the people who are, are just basically out collaborating the competition because like these large groups, they're just too clumsy. Like the government can't move as efficient, efficiently as a very small group of people who are just very well integrated, who are like, we're never even conflicting because we have this set of tools that is, you know, trying before we even think about it to help us solve those conflicts so you don't get to this point where you have this messy thing at open ai where you're like okay we're firing the ceo and then you're like oh no the president left oh no all the talent is leaving oh no we have to get this guy back you know it's that's a very clumsy way of of mediation between people so it's like a scalpel versus like a like a very heavy bat and um i wouldn't i wouldn't write us off yet uh for in terms of having new capacities emerge that make for a better future for all people cautiously optimistic <laughs> um mm-hmm. you were talking earlier about mm, individuals being able to express themselves in various ways and have the uh, implications of those expressions toward accuracy and well-being credited back to them and things like mm-hmm. that and i'm i'm curious about doing that with different kinds of sets of people i'm actually thinking yeah. of an incident in the book wisdom of crowds where they Mm-hmm. Uh, they took an average sampling of a group of experts on something before they went to a conference. And then after they went to a conference and their average accuracy went down because they got group think from being at the conference, yeah. but yeah. then it was course corrected for by introducing a couple of random individuals into the mix. Mm-hmm. So there's this idea that uh, certain sets of people might be able to do that in ways that exceed individuals. Right. Mm-hmm. And then there's all kinds of different groupings. Um, Would there be ways in what you see to like, almost like uh, mine for the combinations of people that produce better guesses? Yeah, that's sort of the foundation of Mm -hmm. 
of of cognitism is that you have a timeline of knowledge which is that's the way it works man like scientists progresses linearly and then you take the entire bag of it and for some reason you throw all of that into a bag and try to weight it evenly by predicting the next token and then are surprised that there are some problems in in that space of how it integrates it but it is very important to have not one behemoth algorithm that is doing all of this integration because you very much can get this group think and it's very important to have in your model a mechanism that is related to dissonance against the crowd whereby essentially what you have is there is a group the belief they're at the top of that hill and there are a set of people who are just like kind of on the edges and they're pushing out it into the landscape of knowledge and they say something that people don't want to fucking hear generally just by the natural you know mechanisms of people communicating with people science progresses knowledge progresses but often very slowly and often a way that ends up with way more harm than is necessary like the removal of lead from gasoline took far too long where you had uh i think claire peterson or patterson i can't remember his name but he was seeing that you know there are these problems with um lead affecting human well-being he was seeing that it was not common for lead to be concentrated in the surface of the soil and the industries fought against him like they they put money actively uh behind researchers to discredit him and eventually the truth came out right but like I said, if you have this distributed weighting of the sources of voices where it's like the person who gets there first is upweighted later, and then like all of those scientists who, you know, fought against that, there's like some tangible uh, down weighting of their voice in the future, people aren't really going to want to actively lie for some monetary signal because there's this other signal of trust which counterbalances it. it's like i will pay you this much it's like yeah but then i won't be able to do my job because nobody will respect my voice because i had to put on record that i believe this for people to actually trust it so in cognizism there's a big push to have many different irises which is the name of the model um, many different groups of people with different perspectives integrating their local knowledge that is different and there is a process of that knowledge pooling together into a global layer which is relevant to all people but the focus really is on the individual knowledge the individual differences in opinion and the motion of that opinion over time whereby speaking against the crowd for better or for worse if it leads to positive outcomes um is up is up sample right so that people are actively motivated to be like i have done this research i have really pressed through this i disagree with the crowd and i understand that speaking out in this way traditionally might blackball me, might traditionally prevent me from having the basic material needs that I need to survive. But I know now that if I put on record uh, that I am pushing against the, the voice of the crowd, the current collective wisdom, that as evidence accrues, that will ultimately benefit me and my position in the future relative to this so yeah it's very it's very important to have that notion of knowledge evolving over time that there are many different people that disagree that there is a bell curve of or an overton window and the overton window is shifting right 
And the motion of that Overton window can tell us a lot about how we should um, collectively make decisions. Often we just get into a set of beliefs that are very illogical and they're just the established paradigm. And because it takes a lot of effort to think and because it takes a lot of energy to rewire brains, brains kind of shut down. Uh, like it, It's like there's a hierarchy of knowledge and you have these first principles, whether you know them or not, which are the foundation of everything. And if you get a very clear piece of evidence that contradicts something down there, the brain will do a lot to fight against that. Like you'll just get all sorts of thoughts that push you against hearing that because then you have to do a lot of thought. Then you have to consume a lot of calories to like rewire that. And it requires the guidance of your consciousness and awareness to, to restructure in a useful way. So we don't really want to update. And so if we can have an incentive, and I think it's a sort of a sampling incentive, a trust incentive um, for your word that says, hey, if you speak against the crowd, the sooner you do that and the, and the more accurate you're right, like the, the relationship between the time that you say it and the accuracy, would you say like, because when we first get it, you might have a little half-baked idea that is partially right and partially wrong. So there's a relationship between how soon you speak and you upsample that and you use that as a mechanism to create these integrated representations of collective intelligence. And then you use those integrated uh, perceptions of the collective intelligence to mediate between people um, who are fighting and who have long had a hard time seeing each other, this humanity in each other then I think that we can use collective intelligence in a much more a much more intelligent way than just a tallying. I, I think we'll look back on democracy and we'll look back on the way that we integrated our perceptions is very, very simple and very low resolution and very silly. Like I I, I hope I live in a world where it's like my grandchildren are like, what do you mean all you could do is say one vote for a person? What do you mean I can't just be like, I just disagree with the world and just say that and have it be reflected in our system? That doesn't make any sense. Why would you live that way? Well, you know, the brain, you know, what's the... Are there any possibilities for doing this kind of thing with our own psychological collective? Like, what are the odds I could get an assistant that makes it easier to uh, upsample the parts or impulses in myself, even if they're contrarian, that tend to lead to uh, better longer range outcomes for myself? It's a really interesting question. Can you rephrase it in another way, just so that I make sure that I, I have the gist of it? Um, yeah, like if my if my psyche is a collective as well, and it has yeah. various voices or parts or impulses, yeah. and like, you know, everybody's familiar with, you know, maybe I want to eat a chocolate bar right now, but there's another voice that says, no, you're not going to want to have eaten that chocolate bar tomorrow, right? Is there is there some way that uh, digital tools could evolve to help me um, sort of increase the weighting of the voices that tend to have more beneficial, more empowering, more flourishing outcomes for me over time. Possibly, but I mean, I can't control what thoughts arise in my psyche. I, I know that there's a big part of environment and the repetition of signals that are around you. So if you place within your informational context, um, a repetition of certain concepts that's going to inform the type of thoughts that you have. 
like we're we're semantic um associators right so like for things like intrusive thoughts like intrusive thoughts happen because you saw something that is related to that like there are people who have seen like incredibly violent films and it gets stuck in their head but there was a source there was a source of that that signal and then the brain starts to repeat that signal and reproduce more thoughts like that it's difficult to control what arises um in your mind but the environment the set and setting of your existence really does inform a lot of that that's why with you know psychedelics you know the set and setting is so very important your trip is not going to generally reflect something completely out of the context of your general experience um granted you take enough you're you're basically firing off everything at once so you're getting all of your knowledge at once and that is a type of technology <laughs> that's a type of technology that can help upregulate those voices i mean we often don't want to hear the tinier voices in our head that are contrary to the um, established paradigm in our mind. And so you kind of have to actively take the choice to expose yourself to uncertainty, right? To expose yourself to that which you're not familiar with, to get off of that sort of deterministic path. like. I sort of feel that consciousness resolves uncertainty, which is a fundamental real thing. And brains can almost be as deterministic as they choose to be, right? If you choose to be in that path, that looping path, you're going to reinforce that that set of pathways to the day you die so that you're just the same person forever. And you're never really um, upsampling those edge voices right but if you're constantly in a state of journaling and you're constantly expressing even the deeper parts of the that knowledge you very much could say okay this is the like um like if you go into the GPT settings, there's something called temperature and it's more deterministic and and represents the input data if you have it much lower, right? So if you have this journal and it's trying to form this generative representation of you, you turn that temperature up, it's going to be things that are more on the edge, right? I like to think of it like, and I, I have built tools to use it this way that I have a Ken, which is like your conscious event horizon. That is the edge of all knowledge that you have within your mind. Um, you can't have, ac you don't really have access to it all at the same time. So there's like a smaller Ken, which is just what you're thinking about right now. And then there's the structures of neural connection that can form new thoughts and the ways that those connect will produce um new things and there's a limit to your vocabulary for example so one thing that i i developed just based off of word embeddings which is like the representation of language behind uh these models which is like a sort of semantic field where you can do mathematical operations which is like king minus man equals queen minus woman like there is some uh, sort of math you could do upon those things you can say okay here's my journal here's the set of knowledge that I have the language set that I have the vocabulary that I have and because it has a larger knowledge base which is the all of humanity you could say okay here is my personal model in relation to the collective model here's the edge of it and it can give you things that are just on the edge that you are most likely to 
actually trigger flow because there has to be some level of ease paired with difficulty. But it could it could see like these are the topics that might enrich your mind and then start presenting things on the edge. But it would be always sort of in relationship to collective intelligence in contrast to your individual intelligence. On the inside, you know, your brain's just going to fuck with you. It's going to do. It's going to do what it does. Uh, but you, yes, the idea of having a map of your knowledge and a map of the wider knowledge, and then you can see the edge of that horizon and be like, hey, this word, this paper, this idea connects to where you are at and maybe if you apply your human cognition to this problem, you're going to get out some new piece of information, some novelty that is beneficial to you. And I don't know necessarily if we if it can perfectly predict the things to upsample that will ultimately benefit you but it certainly can find that edge and it certainly can bring in pieces of information that are likely to form novel connections insofar as other people have already done that type of cognition and have already traced that path so it can it can be a path recommender yeah I potentially a more optimal flow prompter relative to general human knowledge. Yeah. Keep um, you from getting you into yeah. just keep you from getting into those local optima, right? Mm -hmm. You you're you're circling around a basin, you're not getting stimulated. The algorithm is not stimulating you because the algorithm is always just trying to produce things that you already are focused on. So you can up that temperature and say, I specifically am trying to go to the edge of the curve. I specifically want knowledge that is going to challenge me. And it might not be as interesting. It might not keep you on site as much because, you know, there's a, that signal is less certain, but it can give you up a platter and on that platter you know your own attention is going to draw you towards something and then you just you dig in at the beginning of this conversation you were talking about the way uh entertainment and narrative have set up some false expectations around ai maybe particularly in terms of us imagining the a self-aware agent waking up from inside a machine as opposed to yeah. understanding that it's a, a mask like interface with a hive, but um, what, what entertainment, what art, what sci-fi, whatever it is, do you think is pretty good? Like if you were going to recommend somebody read or watch something, what's not bad on this topic? <laughs> nothing, literally nothing comes to mind. <laughs> um, there's just not a lot of, people with experience in both fields and the progression into these models has been so recent. And even in the field of AI researchers, there was so much pushback and like Jeffrey Hinton, who is like, you know, sort of often viewed as like the grandfather, godfather of deep learning. Um, was blind. He says that he was sort of blindsided by the fact that we got here so quickly. And I found that so fascinating to me because, um, you know, I, I, he's like the one researcher that I sampled in the Cognizant Manifesto. I, I, and yet I had the intuition. I, as somebody who is not as well established as him, I, I could just see within my sense senses that something, there's a little tiny voice in me and a little cluster of neurons, little all these voices trying that are competing for attention. And somewhere in me, it spoke loud enough to say, um, this is where we are going. And that intuition 
went beyond just a summing of all of the narratives or novels that uh, I had consumed. I can't begin to say I, I fully understand where, you know, visions <laughs> or creativity comes from. Like I, as a songwriter, um, like I will sometimes get full downloads and like downloads for me are, are a very common thing. Like just a wholly formed mental model. I'm like, how, <laughs> like where, where did this come from in a way that is, you know, so different and doing in a sense that which I was just talking about, which is finding that edge. It's like, where does this fully formed thing come from? Is there some sort of part of my brain in the subconscious that is able to fire off and iterate before it bubbles up to my awareness? Um, but yeah, I have not seen anything that represents AI not as an integrated singular agent maybe like like there, there's some things like borg mind which are trying to sum them together but still the thing is they become one there there's not like a borg mind that still maintains the agency and freedom of the um individual beings that form that whole that encourage them or enable them to be their own beings that step outside of the realm oh uh there are some things that the one okay one example came to mind which is Orson Scott Card has like the Ender's Game universe and there is one of the newer books. The the formics are sort of a hive mind and traditionally they're relate they're framed as having no agency and the hive mind or the the queen can sort of alter her own DNA to create new forms of beings and to be able to relate to the um, the humans within that space. She creates a modification of one of her drones, which is on that edge, which both has some sort of agency and there is a communication between the individual nodes that form something larger. And, you know, like if we go into like our own cognition, there, there, there does seem to be something like there are a bunch of competing clusters of neurons that fire off that form thoughts that are vying for our attention. And then we as an identity, which seems to be rooted in some particular structure of neurons relates to that and forms an integration of those and you know if you take a, a, a hallucinogen or something you can dissolve those those lines or something so maybe the the place that that we should look is not like narratives about ai but it's just the way that our own cognition already works to try to form these loose senses of oneness in a reality where there is a constraint on the, sp the speed limit of light. So therefore, you know, all of the parts of our brain actually have to pretend to be um, one being when in actuality there is clusters of activation that meet and form like crests or waves that um, form your, your experience. So maybe maybe some Orson Scott card stuff is on the edge, but mostly. I was no. thinking of him earlier because of the speaker in your name. That is part of where it came from. Yeah, the whole uh. notion of um, 
the truth that people don't want to hear and going and to a funeral and framing a person in a way that doesn't try to pretend that they were perfect or good, but really trying to lift up the things that don't, people don't want to hear uh, has been a big inspiration for me is how I communicate. Uh, I guess we're just about at the end of this thing. I, one more question would be, uh, who do you think's doing uh, good thinking in this area or has instincts or is getting good downloads? Who do you, who do you respect at the moment? You know, we're in the we're in the very we're, we're in the very early days of this. You know, if you come back to me in six months to a year, I'm sure there will be more people. Uh, but there are people doing other types of non-AI based um, you know, forms of consensus. There are things like mutual credit currencies and there's something like common planet and there there are people who are challenging the notions of how we integrate but they're often you know they're very on the edge so either they have some mental illness or they have something that keeps them from integrating with other people at scale so their projects are limited. The one thinker that I respect quite a bit who's not in AI is uh, Matt Perkowski. Like his understanding about energy and about time preference, about like where we place our attention, uh, seems to be very much on the money. And then there's a group of people in the active inference community, which is part of him as well. So I believe Maxwell Ramstead and uh, Daniel R. R. E. Friedman from the separately from the um, Active Inference Institute, they are thinking um, in terms of surprise and prediction error um and like active inference the model the model itself which is trying to minimize uh free energy or the, or the sense that sense of surprise in in general over time to create a generative model of the world and like daniel has worked with um like a lot with ant colonies and the chemical signals that they sort of trace out that help form that collective whole when there isn't a singular when you're distributed across space and time so it's like not like the queen can be like you are doing this right now like there has to be some set of collective feedback signals that form the greater whole so th those are people who aren't necessarily working in the traditional AI, they're working in this new paradigm that is more reflective of, that is that is more reflective of how intelligence seems to actually function. So there's also Digital Gaia, which is building upon those principles of uh, different agents representing different ecologies um, and trying to utilize the intelligence of different sources of information to create outcomes that benefit the greater whole. So there's some things, but not in the, not in the deep learning space that I've seen. It's like adjacent to the deep learning space. Interesting. Okay, that's probably as much as we can expect anybody to track at one time. Uh, yep. Thanks a lot. This has been really rich. Um, thanks for doing this. And uh, 
good luck with the health of your animal friends. Thank you so much. <laughs> this has been a great conversation. Thanks. Yeah, cheers, man. Good to meet you. He's a... Uh...